year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? I looked on my calendar of special dates, and today is actually Make the World a Better Place Day. And I think that's something that each and every one of us are responsible for doing. Uh, I am a very fortunate person, and I am grateful every day for the people that I get to meet both live and virtually through this medium. And today I get to celebrate a very special man, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. One of my favorite genres of film is documentary. And of course, I love the movies. And every once in a while, a home run is hit when those two genres come together. And that's the case with our special guest today. Gregory Orr uh, has an incredible documentary uh, called uh, Jack L. Warner, The Last Mogul. Uh, this is not a new documentary. Uh, this documentary came out in 1993, I think it was. He'll correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then uh, we are now celebrating the 100th uh, birthday of Warner Brothers. So, of course, there's a lot of celebration about Jack L. Warner and his body of worth, as I like to refer to it as. And so this film has been restored. It's been remastered, and it is available now on demand. I saw it when it first came out, but I went back and I watched it last night, and that's what we're going to celebrate today. But before I bring Gregory on, here's the trailer for the film. Enjoy. Who was Jack Warner? He was a stand-up comic with a mustache and a cigar in his mouth, and when he walked into a room, the room would light up one way or the other. And if somebody had to guess what he did for a living, they would never ever imagine that he was a movie mogul or the head of a studio. When you think of Warner Brothers movies, you think of speed. You think of action. You think of Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, Humphrey Bogart, Betty Davis. No other studio has stars like those. And I believe those stars are all made in the image of Jack Warner. That is how Jack Warner idealized himself, a fast-talking, flashy underdog. There were many facets of him. Wonderful sense of humor, very compassionate, very loving, but also very, very, very cool. He could just turn on you just like that. They don't make too many men like my father, which is, in a certain sense, that's, that's good for humanity, but it's also not too good because it takes people who are out of the ordinary to push the rest of us who aren't. He was the last of the moguls. And he was the last one. Gregory, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Uh, seeing that uh, trailer, I, I'm inclined to watch the movie now. It's, uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 was, I, I was so tired when I, I was out all day yesterday. I came in I, and I said, I want to sit down and watch it again so it's fresh in my mind. And there's so many uh, aspects of this film. First of all, congratulations. It's a great, great film. Uh, I love the fact that the film opens, for the most part, uh, showing home movies. Uh, of you uh, at your grandfather's uh, and, uh, you know, and the fact that you uh, started out yourself almost as a filmmaker because you as an astronaut, uh, Steven Spielberg could not touch what you were able to create the, at that age. So it was, it was a lot of fun seeing that footage again, seeing uh, your grandparents' home and learning so much about your grandfather. Uh, and we're going to digest all those things in a moment, but one thing that stood out for me, which I absolutely loved, and of course I laughed out loud, and this is the only spoiler uh, I'm hopefully will give away today, but when you talked about you know, seeing all of these iconic photos uh, of your grandfather with so many of the great stars, some of them that we just saw here, uh, you knew that this man was an important man. 
But what solidified it for you was that car ride, you know, through Hollywood where he was going through all the traffic lights when he was finally pulled over uh, and he pulled down his driver's license, the traffic cop acknowledged who he was and said, just be a little bit more careful. That was a defining moment for you. It was. I was about 12. We were on our way to a baseball game at Dodger Stadium. And I was in the back seat of his uh, Bentley. I don't know who else was. Maybe my father was with us or my brother. But uh, yeah, in Beverly Hills, we got pulled over. And, uh, you know, I just, uh oh, we're going to get a ticket now. <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is bad. And when I see that police officer just uh, look at the license and uh, take a beat, <laughs> to like, oh, how do I handle this? And let my grandfather go, he probably should have gotten a ticket. But it did impress on me that this guy has some clout, as I say in the uh, in the movie, uh, because I knew him just from the world he had created within. Sure, you go to the studio, that's very impressive. And he's in his big office and uh, he has a very large home that my grandmother redecorated for him when, when they got married. And uh, so it was impressive. His world was impressive. But now outside his world, on the streets of Beverly Hills, that a police officer also had to adjust to him or decided to adjust to him and let him go, let him off with a warning. Uh, that told me something. I hadn't quite figured out what it was, but it definitely said, hmm, this guy's big. Well, there may be some out there who don't know Jack L. Warner, but there, I don't think there's a person alive over the age of 10 that does not know Warner Brothers uh, because it's such an iconic part of our history. And uh, obviously, I mean, the film is a labor of love. Uh, hopefully it was a labor of love creating it as well. Uh, but it, when were you first aware of the magnitude, not of your grandfather, but of what Warner Brothers stood for in the pantheon of movies? I think I came to that while researching the movie. Uh, back in 1990, my grandmother had died and my grandfather died in 1978. And this beautiful nine acre estate they had uh, built uh, was being put on the auction block. And uh, I knew a way of Hollywood history was just going away, was disappearing. So a friend of mine, Don, who later became the editor of this film, uh, he had a, a video camera and I called him. I didn't have one actually at the time. And uh, we drove up there and she started documenting the house, the grounds of this beautiful estate. And that led to, I thought maybe a little film about the house and then a larger film about Jack Warner, because as I got into it, I realized officially that this, there's a big story here. And I have access to all kinds of to people and, and special material and the home movies and lots of photos and the locations of his life. Uh, so I, I jumped in for three years, raised money. I mean, I said, okay, I'm gonna make this a big project. And doing that uh, gave me a, a sense of the larger breadth of that studio. And the- So was uh, it the auction legacy. itself that was the impetus for you to get started on this? Well, my aunt was handling the sale, Jack Warner's daughter with, um, with my grandmother. I'm Jack Warner's step-grandson. My, my grandmother, married Jack Warner when my mother was about nine. So my mother moved up there at age nine and Jack was always my grandfather. We didn't, no one referred to him as a step-grandfather. He was very good to, to we grandkids. But um, my aunt wanted to handle the sale and that was fine with my mother. And uh, so she, you know, who's gonna buy, who's gonna be able to afford a nine acre property in Beverly Hills? And uh, I don't know what price she put it up for, but I know David Geffen came in and was very yeah. interested. And uh, the story I, I heard from my aunt, Barbara, was uh, David had come up maybe a couple of times. And one time he brought Steven Spielberg with him. And in the, uh, the lower floor of the house, uh, which was built slightly on a hill, so it wasn't underground, this room, but it's where the projection room and a living room and a bar, beautiful bar, in that room were these bookcases filled with Warner Brothers scripts bound in leather and including publicity photos. They were beautiful. And I'd go there as a kid and read some of those. And, uh, and they were, it's a lovely collection of mostly the A films. And uh, it filled up these giant bookcases. And my aunt told me that David was there with Steven Spielberg. And Steven looked at the scripts and uh, took out, I think, Rebel Without a Cause. I was looking through it. 
excitedly and like, my God, look at this beautiful collection of scripts and turned to uh, my aunt and said, do you, do you think I could borrow this? And my aunt said, you can have it, Dick. You can have it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you can have it if you want. You can still have it. <laughs> right? You may still have it. So I think David Geffen may have said, hmm, my friend Stephen's impressed by this house, so maybe it's worth buying. And, uh, and so that was happening fairly quickly, that sale. And so I thought I better get up there. And, and David, to his credit, allowed me to keep filming. I filmed a couple of times over different days, but uh, he could have said, no, it's going to be my house one soon. So I don't want any more pictures taken of it. But he did. He let me come up there and shoot some material. And uh, that formed the original basis. But as I said, it expanded into a mm -hmm. feature length documentary about Jack's life. Well, I had the good fortune of interviewing uh, Debbie Reynolds, the, uh, who was in the film, uh, and I interviewed her the night before her last auction. And it was truly one of the saddest uh, interviews that I think I've ever done because her passion and her love for film and the fact that her entire life from 1974, when MGM had its famous auction, and they started, uh, a lot of things were gonna be thrown out until someone got the bright idea of auctioning things off, um, not realizing at that time, again, this is 1973, uh, that there was such a love by so many people of this history that was there. Um, at this time, this auction was happening. Did you already have within you a love and an appreciation for what had gone before? I did, but I came to movies in a funny way. I had lots of filmmaker friends who came to movies by going to the movie theater or watching the, you know, the Saturday matinee on TV, a uh, million dollar movie on TV. And I came to loving movies by watching them being made. Going to Warner Brothers was a treat for me. We couldn't go that often, but my father worked there also as head of television when I was a kid. So I love the way movies were made, the gathering of people to, to produce something, the focus of everybody around that pool of light where the actors were and uh, the rest of the sound stage being dark, dim. And I, I could sit there all day. So understanding both the movies and the actors and what they meant took a little longer for me. I mean, I watched movies, I certainly was growing up, I did, but uh, my appreciation was in the making of them. So David Geffen wanted everything in the house. Uh, he wanted to buy the house with practically everything in it which I understand some of that, he put that, he put the house up for auction, the, the contents up for auction at Christie's. And, uh, you know, he's a smart businessman for a reason. He, so he mm -hmm. made some money off of the sale of various, various items. But seeing the catalog, uh, but you know, in some ways as a filmmaker, once my grandparents died, the house became like a movie set. I need to film it and then you can strike the set. I didn't need any more from it. Uh, when I was up there at one point filming, one of the, the, the housekeeper who'd been there a long time said, uh, why don't you take something? At that very moment, I was looking through my grandfather's address book, which had you know, Cary Grant's address and the drugstores and everybody else in Hollywood's phone numbers and addresses in this handwritten address book. Yeah. There was a slight temptation, but it was also, you know, I've got it on film in a sense. I've, I've captured it. That was the point of my visit. Uh, David Geffen is buying this house. He wants all the contents. I'm not going to steal that. Maybe I was foolish, but it, it was later on display in, in the Museum of Modern Art and so forth, this phone book. But um, no, that was my feeling about it, that there's a beautiful house. and I loved going there as a kid. You had to make an appointment. You couldn't just show up at grand, grandpa and grandma's house. There was a studio guard at the gate and you really had to call ahead to go up there but i loved going up there and uh you know that's why it, it was so important to me to, to put it to capture it visually well i'm going to go back early on uh, for you uh here's a photograph of you uh with your grandfather um i love this photograph that you just sent to me and uh uh he's seeing i mean looking at this photograph and i love what at the beginning of your film shirley jones says it you know, when he walked into a room, he lit the room up. People either stayed or they left. <laughs> and that's, you know, and that's a great comment to get in the film and to start the film with. Um, as you set out on this journey of getting to know your uh, grandfather, I have to say that, you know, watching this, I had this little 
uh, tinge or twinge of guilt or, or uh, regret that I didn't have such a history of my own grandfathers uh, and getting to know them. These photographs, the archival footage, all of that was available to you. Did that come easily for you or was it a difficult uh, struggle to get all of that together uh, to give us a real strong sense of his uh, trajectory to Hollywood, if you will? Yeah, I was very fortunate to have all that visual material. I had to go to certain libraries to get a lot of it. It wasn't in the family collection directly, uh, though my father had uh, copies of it and obviously my, my aunt and mother, but we didn't have everything. Uh, I needed help from Warner Brothers, uh, USC Cinema Library has a big Warner collection because my grandfather donated mm -hmm. uh, so much of his material, including 50, about 50 scrapbooks he kept over the years. Uh, you don't think of Jack Warner as a sentimental man and he could be gruff and make jokes. Uh, he often used jokes to, to sort of paper over deeper feelings or uncomfortable feelings. And um, so looking through these scrapbooks at USC, big leather bound scrapbooks where he had seemingly pasted in a lot of the stuff himself, or if he hadn't, some assistant had pasted it in, he wrote commentary throughout the scrapbook. You know, great time was had by all, or the good old days, or there's Rin Tin Tin. So these are something, I don't know if he spent any time looking through them, but it mattered to them. He keep the record of his life and the people in it. And so it struck me, and there's letters in there and, and uh, you know, uh, publicity sheets from movies and uh, the invitation from the jazz singer premiere, which he did not attend at the end of the day because of his brother's death. And yeah, so there's a sentiment line there, which, you know, we made copies of and used a lot of that material in the film. They make a great coffee table book, those, those scrapbooks, because it is the life of a movie mogul, you know, from 19... 10 or so. Is that um, something that we may see in your future? It's something I've thought about. Uh, USC, I think, would cooperate with it. Um, it's a lot of work. You got to find the publisher who's willing to pay for all that. Oh, I, I know. You know. It's a lot of work. But boy, it does capture. And yeah, there's little notes and, and letters. And uh, you learn things about him that aren't even in my film. I mean, how charitable he could be to lots of people and uh, sending money to actors who had been in the silent days who were struggling or someone whose uh, wife was sick in the hospital and giving some money to help her. So, you know, he wasn't a philanthropist quite in the same way his older brother, Harry Warner was. Uh, he, so he quietly did it. He quietly did it. And uh, that impressed me a lot, those, what was in those scrapbooks. Wow. I'm always interested when I interview authors on this show that I always ask if the first words that we uh, read are the first words that they wrote. And it's very interesting, the stories that I get around that. What was the starting off point for you when you began to create this great documentary? <laughs> well, when I decided to make a more serious documentary than just a 20 minute film for my family about the house and those memories, uh, Don, the editor and I, who had Don had been with me shooting the footage up there. And so he, he was an editor and filmmaker. And I said, can you help me on this? So our first edit was, it was like we were 40 minutes into the edit and we hadn't gotten the family out of Poland yet. So it was it's like, we need, <laughs> we need to rethink this. And um, by the uh, way, that footage that you have is just amazing. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I went to Poland. I went to the small town, crashed Noszlitz, which is about 90 kilometers northeast of Warsaw, uh, just to get a sense of it. it's only in the film briefly, but to get a sense of that life, which you know, still had some horse-drawn uh, wagons at, at the time I went in 1991, I believe. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any remnant, remnants of, of the Jewish population that had been there. They had been moved out, certainly during the Holocaust, but even before they had come under attack from uh, Cossacks and so forth. Uh, and a lot of that footage, unfortunately, does not exist. I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day, and uh, he's been trying to trace his lineage. And because uh, of grandparents and relatives, uh, a few who survived the Holocaust uh, and th these pogroms and everything, a lot of that footage was burned. So it's difficult to find a lot of that. Right. In this case, the synagogue was still there, but it was being used as a storehouse. Uh, the 
uh, headstones from the Jewish cemetery were there. They were being used as paving stones in a workyard, in a municipal workyard where trucks had been parked and so forth. And that, I think they've cleaned that up a little bit. My, my cousin went back there not too long ago and actually had a good, a good conversation with the mayor and various people. And some of that, they realized that this needs to be re fixed, repaired, some of that. But uh, it was the impetus, the pogroms were the impetus for Ben Warner, the Warner Brothers' uh, father, to move in the 1880s to uh, first to Baltimore. And eventually, they ended up in Youngstown, Ohio. He went first, uh, then brought the, old, the, the older sons and then his wife and the other children. Jack was born in Canada while they were up there trying to make it in the fur trade, selling pots and pans to the fur traders. It didn't go well. So, yeah, so the Jewish connection, I definitely wanted that feeling because it, it does permeate uh, Harry Warner, the oldest brother's life, and Albert, the next oldest. Jack, it was important to, but not in the same way. He always considered himself Jewish, and, but he wasn't as religious as, as observant as his older brothers, which is part of the tension, which we can mm -hmm. certainly go into on that. So, yeah, it, making this film, and I, I recommend it to other people, who, whose grandparents are elderly or whose parents do something to Absolutely. capture, you know, uh, not only either put them on video, film them, or at least do audio, do an interview or a couple of interviews. And the other thing I would, would urge people to do is take the old family photos and, and go through with, with the older family members and say, who's in this photo and write on the photo who's there, because that's, that's a common, I think, mistake. Uh, of who is this? And it's just not written down. I Who's know. That photo? Right. So, Evan Simlis Jr. is your narrator for the film. Was he always your first choice uh, to be the narrator? Or, uh, I mean, what was your uh, process in terms of getting to him to do this? He had been doing a lot of narration. I didn't know him very well. He had worked at Warner Brothers in both movies and in the television show 77 Sunset Strip, which my father was executive producer on. So I certainly knew of Ephraim. I knew I could reach out to him. I thought of other people, but I liked Ephraim's voice. And plus, he had an emotional attachment to the studio. And when I wrote him, I called him up. Uh, he said, absolutely, Greg, whatever you want. I said, all right, let's discuss the fees. He says, whatever you want to pay me is fine. So he was very giving. He was in, a, in his life, I don't know if he did this throughout, but in this later part of his life, he was very charitable. He had a, uh, I think he converted to Christianity mm -hmm. and wanted to wa walk a certain charitable life, a giving life. And uh, I know he'd done it for others. And with me, you know, I did pay him. I felt I should. Uh, but he was just very generous with his time. And I loved his voice and the narration. And, uh, so he, he did put up with me in whatever occasional directions I offered him about reading those that narration. So, uh, yeah, it was part of the family. It was an extension of the family. And that was my feeling growing up, that these people, and it was partly a naive feeling, too, uh, that all these people who worked at Warner Brothers were part of a family, <laughs> extension of my family, even. And I could and with everything that entails functioning, dysfunctioning, dysfunctioning. everything. And yeah. they would have the same emotional or have they would have an emotional connection to the studio. But and most people did. But uh, I felt now that I was a little I don't know if the word's entitled or just that other people would be interested in helping me in the documentary because it was about Warner Brothers and I was an, uh, a family member, a grandson and all that. And for the most part, they were. Others were not so interested in talking. They, I, for, I don't think it's a slight towards me, but just they, they didn't have the same feeling. I know Warren Beatty, who's very difficult to get a hold of anyway for interviews. He doesn't really like to do them. Was nice about it and said, no, I don't really want to. He didn't really respond properly to yes or no. But um, and some of the bigger actors just didn't, you know, they may have had mixed feelings about Jack Warner and didn't want to talk about him to, to a grandson, to a family member. Mm -hmm. uh, so reaching out to this extended family, I started to see, oh, there's more nuance. And the entire process of making this film and remaking it now, 30 years later, mm -hmm. uh, was the discovery of uh, there's a mixture of feelings and also more information. I was a little naive about about my grandfather being, you know, a hearty, hearty, sometimes difficult guy, but everybody in the end sort of appreciated him. 
but that's not necessarily the case. So did the film turn out uh, the way that you had envisioned it or did it take a completely different life of its own and become the film that we know today? Well, you're right about with a documentary film, you've got to let the sort of the evidence or the footage lead you. So um, I had a story to tell, but was there supporting material for it? Was it interesting within a, an hour and a half, you know, or a hundred minute film? Uh, I had a little bit of a, what's the word, a, a cross purpose goal in making it. One was to preserve, preserve aspects of my family mm -hmm. along with Jack Warner. Uh, but the other was also to make a good movie that an audience that doesn't know anything about Jack Warner or maybe even care that much about movie history would find interesting, would could relate to it. Um, so that's the fine line of cutting things down and cutting out stuff that's favorite, you know, favorite moments or scene or uh, that had to be done. Someone once said that a good book doesn't really begin until page five or six because there's always that to set up for it. And then the story itself. So when a lot of people are reading a, a memoir or a biography, they want to get, to, excuse me, they want to get to the meat and potatoes as quickly as they possibly can. Right. Um, and sometimes those early pages can be quite boring. Um, in the case of this film, uh, we go into this because we want to know about Warner Brothers Studios and the films of the stars and everything. But everything that led up to that uh, would make a great movie on its own. I mean, it, it, they're, uh, the Warner Brother family, and in terms of their entrepreneurship, that by the time they even got to the point where, as their, as their story is starting to unfold, movies, as we came to know them and know today, didn't even exist. But one of the things that they did in all these other businesses that they had leading up to their career in the films uh, was all about something that we is lacking today, and that's customer service. So they knew their customers, they knew their who these people were, and so when they got to the film part of it, they also tapped into those aspects that they had brought along the way. Now that's a good point. I'm glad you bring that up. Uh... Yeah, I think in the back of their heads was the idea of who is the average customer, the average American going to first to their bicycle shop, to their the family meat market in Youngstown. They had a little bowling alley at some point. They tried all kinds of businesses mm -hmm. and failed oftentimes, you know, uh, couldn't keep it going. So they were businessmen and they started small. And then this projector came into their life in 1904 that Sam Warner, who was two years older than Jack, had discovered while working in Chicago for uh, a, uh, a, uh, an exhibition site uh, called Hales Tours where they had a mocked up a railroad car and a projector would show a trip through Yosemite National Park or some other venue and the train car would be rocked up and down slightly. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I love the footage that you have on that, it, by the way. It's, it's you know, this was, a, this was a brand new, uh, you know, medium created by technology. That's what's, that's what's so interesting. It is, you know, now, now we have the internet age, that's a new medium too. And people got in early to the, what's become, you know, dominating our lives now. They got in early to what had been a craze. People went to the movies all the time just to see anything mm -hmm. because nobody had that in their life. It was worth seeing. It was just worth seeing, let's go see this. It was cheap, I mean, nickel, nickel owning cost a nickel. So that's where it first started, these short little films. That's, I think there's, we've come full circle where, you know, it started with these short little one minute films. You go into a Nickelodeon parlor and put your head against a little viewer and watch someone doing something. And now we're watching TikTok on our phones and a little viewer. Interesting so it's, thought. That's interesting. It's yeah. really come around. But uh, yeah, so they got into this by thinking, oh, we can make money because there's an audience where people are crazy about going to Nickelodeon. So they opened a little movie theater of their own in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and that did amazingly well. And they opened another theater and they thought, well, this is mostly Harry Warner, the oldest brother, who's a very bright businessman. And I'm told could, could convince anyone of anything. He could sell very well. And he was always Actually, looking- in Alaska. Right, <laughs> exactly. And uh, so they decided to open a film exchange, which seemed like a better business because you, the film exchange at the time, which maybe it's, it's called the distributor now, 
would take movies that people had made and then get them to theaters and then get them back and send them to another theater. So you were sort of the, you were the middleman between the filmmaker or the film company and the movie theaters. And uh, so they did pretty well in that until the Thomas Edison Trust shut them down. Since Edison had invented the movie camera, not the movie projector, but the movie camera, he had uh, put a control over all movies he had said, and I guess the government went along with it at the time for a while, that any movie needs to pay me a royalty. Anyone involved in movies has to pay me a royalty. And uh, they also tried to shut independents down so they would control it with their film distribution company, their own Edison's own film distribution company, or some of the majors who they had deals with. So the brothers got bought out by the Edison Trust. They, they were out of business in, I think, 1912. And uh, they, they stopped being in the movie business for a year. And uh, Harry went and opened a, uh, some, some shop in Youngstown, and Jack went to work for another film company in New York. And the one brother sold soap for a while. So, you know, like slam on the brakes, uh-oh. And then they eventually got back together and the Edison Trust had been broken by that time so they could go back into it as independent uh, you know, film distributors and then filmmakers too, making their own movies, early movies. So it's a fascinating history of just don't give up even when it seems, ugh, you've collapsed back down to zero. Like dust yourself off and figure out how to do the next and the other aspect of that is their ultimate landing place wasn't even in existence when they began. So you never know what's ahead of that uh, as well. I want to jump ahead a little bit um, to uh, the jazz singer and the jazz singer opening and the hoopla and everything built around that. And of course, your grandfather was not even at the opening. And you talk about that in the film, but if you can touch upon that a little bit and that major turning point in terms of the way people experience movies. Well, by the time of the jazz singer in, 19, in October, 1927, uh, movies had established, silent movies had established themselves all over the world as a premier form of entertainment and high art, cinematic art also. And uh, you had this beautiful example of, of elaborate pantomime, I guess some people call it, of uh, silent acting. I mean, I know lots of people now look at silent films as, as jerky little yes. things, but, but show at the right speed, um, they're very impressive. And the, mo the money went into and the sophistication. So by, you are at the height of silent films in 20, 1927, by the time the Warner Brothers decide that sound is the future. And they have been making short uh, little musical films and filming vaudeville acts Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with a process called Vitaphone, which is a sound on disc. I mean, it's such a crazy uh, hard way to do it that you have your film running through the movie projector, but then you have a record player, basically, that's synced to the movie theater with a disc on it, with a record that you have to time out and the, the projectionist has to put the needle on the disc at the same time you start. So it's, you know, I'm sure it fell out of sync many times, but they experiment for a couple of years and this future, they had really bet the company on because uh, they were a second class or a third class studio at that time. They had made some hits uh, in silent film, a few things with the great actor John Barrymore, but they were they were not as big as Paramount or MGM, far from it. But with sound and this new Vitaphone project uh, uh, technology, uh, the jazz singer ended up being the thing, the movie that changed it all for them and for the industry. I mean, the, suddenly we had to switch over to sound movies and putting speakers in the movie theaters and figuring out how to do it. So the Warner Brothers had a jump of about a year, certainly, of, over the other studios. And again, the audience was crazy for sound. So they came to Warner Brothers movies. And Warner Brothers made a lot of money in that first year uh, with the jazz singer. Uh, I mean, the, the tragic part of it, and it is almost a, a Greek tragedy that they're all there for their greatest success and the brother who pioneered sound for them, Sam Warner, who was Jack's closest friend growing up, uh, is back in Los Angeles, uh, was an infected, uh, I, I think he may have had some infected uh, dental work mm -hmm. uh, and a sinus, and anyway, this terrible infection, which he can't shake and gets him in the hospital, and he finally, he dies of this, of this infection. 
And the brother is raced back while he's dying to hope to get there in time. They leave From various two, points. They were all scattered out. And they, they, they leave two brothers who I think were in uh, New York. And uh, they, they, they hire a special train to try to get to their brother's side. They bring some doctors with them, actually, some specialists. And they're in Los Angeles, not in New York, when the jazz singer opens to this thunderous applause. So they're not even there for this, this great moment. They're grieving over their brother. Absolutely. He really worked himself. You could, you could argue worked himself to death to make this, make this film. Gregory, as you were making the film uh, originally, um, was there anything that you learned about your grandfather that you didn't know that really stood out above all others in terms of uh, the way you see him? Uh, someone recently said that all of our lives are basically the director's cut. Uh, and I love that, that we present what is our version of ourselves to the world. And there's so many layers to who your grandfather was uh, and is. Um, what did you learn making the film about him that you did not know that really has shaped the way that you see him today? Well, I thought of him as a child, as a, as a funny sort of vaudevillian. He always held the floor. Uh, my father worked for him. So I'd hear stories and he was very close to my grandfather. So I'd hear, I'd hear a lot of stories, but always from the studio's point of view. So I looked at the movie industry, not by the struggling actors and directors who were trying to make the best movie they could, but from the front office, who was always complaining that people were either going over budget or someone's trying to take advantage of me. So I, I got a different taste of studio versus the filmmaker. Uh, not that I totally agreed with the front office all the time, but I, as I said, I think I had a one-sided view growing up of, uh, of the movie industry. And I didn't know, I suspected a little bit that not everybody liked my grandfather, but not until later did I realize how many people were annoyed by him, didn't like him. And then in many ways he could be cowardly. He hated uh, confrontation, it seems. He fired my father from head of television, finally in 1966, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't tell him to his face. He had somebody else <laughs> do it. I mean, so it's like, and he went to Palm Springs to be on vacation, you know, to, for the weekend. So it's, that wasn't very nice of him. This is his son-in-law and a longtime employee and loyal employee who he decided to get rid of. And uh, they patched it up pretty well, surprisingly, but they never spoke about it. They never spoke about the firing. So, you know, so in looking at, Jack's behavior and what others said about him, he could be difficult to be around and like, unless you were sort of easygoing yourself, I think. Like Betty Davis came around, she fought with him and he respected her for fighting him. He did respect people who stood up to him if he thought they had talent and you know weren't unreasonable about standing up to him, but, and gave them better parts. I understand that he gave- I mean, she really, I, she way ahead of women's lib right. and feminism. Uh, she truly was her own person, and she stood up to the entire machinery that is Warner Brothers. She did. She was very brave. She lost her case. She sued to get out of her contract, and she lost at the time because the contract, is, you know, your your listeners probably know, is that uh, you know a seven year contract could go on forever if they put you on suspension. They would just add those those weeks or months to the end of your contract. And they could put you on suspension whenever they wanted to. So this contract would go on extra years. And you had no control over the material either. And you had no real control over what movies you're going to be in. Or they could loan you out to another studio. That happens quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would pocket the money that the other studio paid for that right. You didn't get that money as the actor under contract. The studio got that money. So, um, so Betty Davis, uh, you know, pushed back. And when she lost the... Uh, the court battle to get out of her contract, uh, I'm told that uh, Warner Brothers did give her better parts. They said, this woman deserves, we don't what one, we don't want her to sue us again, but <laughs> she's shown herself as pretty formidable and deserves some better film roles. Cause she was given good and bad. They all were, they were given great scripts and then a lot of bad scripts. I've seen, I've seen the uh, transcripts of uh, phone conversations with uh, Humphrey Bogart and my grandfather, I guess my grandfather's assistant was listening in and taking down all the notes. <laughs> yeah. Where Bogart is just complaining, like, oh, please don't let me, please don't make me do this part. Please, I come on, I've done this for you, I've done that, I need something this. And Jack is just saying, we all have to, you know, 
help the company and, and pull our own weight here. And I, you know, I expect you to do this. We all got to do it. It's, you know, he's trying to be nice about it, encouraging, but it's, he's forcing Bogart to do a role he doesn't want to do, you know, which was not uncommon. So, uh, you know, I've heard from, from people who said, look, I wish we had someone like Jack Warner today. I don't know if they really mean it, but I think what they mean is that you can go to one person and get a decision. And it's true that the head of the studio at that point could say yes or no, and you, you don't have to wait around forever. Well, you know, tonight the Tony Awards are on. Uh, and uh, if you watch the Tony Awards or uh, when uh, a show wins for best play, best musical, uh, best revival, uh, the number of people that go up on stage uh, is mind boggling. Uh, you know, with sometimes it's 40, 50 people that are standing on that stage uh, accepting uh, an award for that film. Uh, just to let everyone know, only the lead producer gets the award. Everyone else who wants to get a Tony Award uh, with their name on it has to pay for that award. Uh, it's only the lead producer. Uh, but it was one person making those decisions. And, uh, and of course, both in the Broadway world and in the theater world, uh, the movie world, uh, that world doesn't exist anymore. Can you even imagine uh, your grandfather in today's movie business? No, and he certainly tried to be in today's movie business once he left Warner Brothers uh, in 1969. He made two films independently for, for Columbia or with Columbia. And one was 1776, based on the Broadway musical. Mm -hmm. The other was a little Western called Dirty Little Billy with Michael J. Pollard. And that was an independent film. And he didn't quite understand, you know, by the early 70s, which was a new generation coming onto, into movie making, he didn't understand the business anymore, which was lawyers, agents were having a big impact, corporations obviously coming in and buying up studios. So he adapted and changed a lot in his life. There's a lot of, I, I admire him for that, that every new change, he, he wasn't stubborn. He saw, he, he went along with it if it would help the company. And, uh, you know, it's a quality uh, I hope everybody can have that, you know, with change comes adaptation if, you, if you're willing to. Otherwise you get steamrolled, you know, or left in the past. I have another photograph I want to share here. And uh, oh, yeah. this, uh, you know this photo, mm -hmm. uh, don't you? Uh, and uh, it's, you know, when I see this photograph and I think of your grandfather, and there he is uh, on the left. Um, and the, wor uh, the, the, the world and the life that he created for himself. I mean, uh, you know, hobnobbing with presidents and royalty. And uh, I don't think there was a person uh, in the world at that time who did not know who your grandfather was. He had a little business card that he'd give to people when they'd say, are you Jack Warner? He said, why, yes, here's my card. And he showed him, say, Jack L. Warner, president, Bon Ton Woolen and Underwear Company. That's the, the joke card he'd give out to people because people did know him and they knew the name. And uh, he loved being a movie mogul. He loved being head of the studio on Sold. And plus, I could see it. He loved talking to people. He was in the people business when you get down to it. Uh, Here's an agent who said, uh, being an agent is a lot like selling shoes, except the shoes talk back. <laughs> well, the, the same could be said for, for being the head of a studio, you, that your talent, everyone's talking back. And, uh, but he, he really loved it. He liked talent. He liked finding talent. He came to New York quite often during the year, each year, to see what Broadway shows or what musical reviews were being done, to see who's doing what, to stay on top of uh, the, the talent. That was in New York. And you take the train, of course. You don't have to come down to the train station to see him off. So he was a guy who I'm told by all kinds of people had enormous energy. He didn't need much sleep. And he just loved to be out in the world. All kinds of world. I mean, even my aunt told me once he went to France to see his daughter. My aunt had, had moved to France, married a Frenchman. At one point, they're in a small village. And they go into a local butcher shop. And my grandfather says, oh, let me see the knives there. He'd grown up working in his father's butcher shop and he started sharpening the knives and showing them. So he just loved to be out and almost performing himself in, in real life. So Gregory, when you did the film, how long did it take you to from start to finish to complete the film? Almost Well, two and a half years, I'd say, um, to get the material. And this is before this is editing on videotape before digital. So any changes you made, you sort of had to start over again. You couldn't mm -hmm. just like, 
lift one thing out and put it back in and you know uh, what you can do with film i mean it's funny i think film and digital are almost similar in that way you just pull out your piece of film and move it or put in another one with videotape you had to sort of start over again uh when you make changes you know and when the film first came out how did you find your audience that's a great question because uh i went to uh PBS, I went to broadcasters, I went to some home video companies. Uh, I even sort of talked to Warner Brothers about it a little bit uh, in terms of distribution. And I could not get distribution in the US. It showed at some film festivals, the, the, fir the first year of the Hamptons Film Festival uh, here, in, here in New York. I've been to. Are you yeah. in New York? I am. Oh. Yeah, I'm down the street I, from you. I, what was that? I'm down the street from you. I'm down the river from you. I, uh, no, I thought you were on the West Coast, so I, I didn't realize you were here. No, I, I moved here about 25 years, 24 years ago. Uh, so the Hamptons Film Festival invited the first year that they opened, and they said, yes, but every, of all, every uh, film we show here has to be on film. And mine was mastered on videotape at the time, and it was going to cost I don't know $10,000 to remaster it on the film. I, it just didn't happen. We'll see if they there's a chance I'll pick it up this year after 30 years and run it as a, you know, a digital 4, 4K. So I couldn't get distribution in the US. Now, PBS uh, International picked it up and sold it everywhere uh, overseas, but it never ran in the United States except a shorter version. I made a 56 minute version of it uh, for the international sale. Mm -hmm. And that was used once by Warner Brothers as a DVD extra. So in the US, most people have not seen this film. And so when I wanted to update it for the 100th anniversary of Warner Brothers, I said, let's do this right. And now I'm going to ask you about that. Excuse me for interrupting. But when um, this year, we're, we're, we just celebrated uh, the 100th uh, birthday of Warner Brothers. Right. Um, was it there? I mean, all of a sudden, were they reaching out to you? Or did you say, wait, I've, I've got this product here. I want to get it out uh, to this uh, new audience. Uh, because thank God for T I, TCM uh, did air it, if I'm not mistaken. They, they have, and now it's available on various streaming platforms, Amazon and Apple and so forth. And uh, there'll be a DVD out, I think in August, or possibly on Jack Warner's birthday on August 2nd, he may be wow. releasing the DVD. It's, re it's about ready. We're picking a date. And, uh, but it will go into other platforms eventually. But uh, Warner's was very helpful in updating. I, I, I did go to them. I said, look, I'd like to make remake this film in high definition. So that means going back for photos you had loaned me in the past and reshooting them in high definition in 4K, actually. And same with the film clips. Uh, they had provided about 10 minutes worth of film clips. And uh, they said, OK, well, we'll do that. And uh, so they were very generous, you know, taking up their time to find this stuff. And I had to pay for some lab costs. They didn't charge me anything separate from that. They did originally. I mean, I had to pay the PBS rate, which is also a lower rate for the film to, use, to license the film clips. But they were very generous in providing high definition copies, which are all in the film now. It, it, the film looks great. All the footage oh, no, it, it, it looks great. And that was important that it could, it could even have a theatrical experience. You could sit in a movie theater and watch it and it would look. Great. Is there a possibility of that? There's some festivals. It, it played at a Jewish film festival in, in Pittsburgh recently. I'm trying to get it. Uh, there's one maybe in San Diego, the Hamptons I'm after. So we'll see. There may be select. And I'd love to show it to Warner Brothers on the lot for employees at Warner Brothers. So I've reached out. Any to chance of that. it being part of the TCM Film Festival? Uh, this year, this last or year, no, we'll rebook. Uh, maybe next year. Maybe next year. So how long has it been since you last saw it? I, like I said, it was a few years ago that the film first uh, had its uh, audience. And now... Uh, thank God it's got a resurgence. Uh, and does that surprise you? Well, it does because, um, you know, Warner Brothers just made their own four part series mm -hmm. that's on uh, HBO or Max, as it's called mm -hmm. now. Uh, and a lot of that's very good. I, I, I learned stuff from that four part series. Um, I don't know what the general audience cares anymore about how, I, I really don't know whether a younger generation cares that much. I know there are movie fans, aficionados, people of our generation and older who, who still love that. TCM is still a very recognized, effective platform for the old. They do a great job there of the older movies. So I don't know how this will sit. And I, 
I made it both for a larger audience now, but if no one was going to want to see it now, I want to make sure that it would be sort of preserved for future generations, you know, that who was curious about what happened during these days. And it might just be historians and film archivists, you know, but I wanted it to be in great, great condition. So the distributor is releasing it and we're getting, you know, it's important to be on, on shows like yours. So I do, I definitely appreciate uh, this time you're spending on it. No, I, like I said, I really love the film. I saw it. Uh, and I, I saw it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of years ago, or maybe I'm imagining that because I've seen so much uh, of the footage. But uh, sitting back and watching it again last night, I just realized what a great, uh, I know that uh, your grandfather would be very proud of this. That's uh, something you. that you should be proud of. Thank you. I did want to recreate the era or the eras. And that's why it opens with a big premiere of 1935 and beautiful pristine footage of downtown Hollywood during the premiere of A Midsummer's Night Dream to put you in the era of what it was like of those surging crowds and the excitement and all the movie stars who come out and the narrator on the newsreel to say, ah, this was Hollywood back then. This was the excitement that, that people felt for movies back then, which I know people love Marvel movies now, but it's still, it's not quite the same thing as it was. I, I can't believe you were saying this because as I was watching this last night, I was thinking, wow, I miss the fact that people went to see a Betty Davis movie or they went to see a Humphrey Bogart movie um, or Joan Crawford. Uh, but nowadays it's the, it's the brand, it seems that's being sold uh, more importantly than even the stars that are in these films. Um, uh, even Tom Cruise with the Mission Impossible films and those films, it's a certain brand, it's a look, um, and uh, it's not the same as these great stories that were created through the studio system. Uh, yes, there were a lot of bad films that came out of it, uh, but thank God for the golden uh, ones that did land. It's true, and uh, you know, I, I... I don't envy someone like David Zasloff, who took over as Warner Brothers Discovery's uh, president, uh, the job he has ahead, or all the studio heads, of what does the audience want and how do we deliver it to them and will they pay for it? Uh, the whole streaming issue, uh, and now the Writers Guild is on strike. Yeah. You know, uh, what's, what's a good model uh, for delivering entertainment to people? Uh, what will pay? So, you know, they're, they're having to make some big decisions. And, and what I think the audience wants stories, wants good stories and presented visually in a compelling way. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the star system is quite the same, I don't think so. Or you just go to a Betty Davis movie because you like Betty Davis. I don't quite think the audience does that anymore. Well, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have a favorite Warner Brothers film? Besides the, the obvious one uh, of Casablanca, uh, <laughs> which is so perfect. And everybody says that, so I'm not saying anything new. But I can say with with Casablanca, uh, my observation of Casablanca, except for Bogart, who is it was a slightly different new new role for him. Mm -hmm. So many of those actors, especially the sporting actors, had played some version of those characters before, some version. So they were they were experts. They were masters at playing that the scene, the little scene they did, the little bits of business they did. And I think with wartime coming up, I mean Europe was involved in war at that time before we were. And uh, I just think it just injected so much emotion of, of, of the world was, on, was teetering on the edge. And I think that ended up in the film, all that feeling. And uh, it's sort of a miracle when it, it's kind of a miracle movie that everything worked and, and still works. Um, now I'm going to bring up a, a sore point. <laughs> go ahead. Forgive me. Good. Uh, I was having too good of a time. Go ahead. So yesterday I uh, was, uh, and I did a show uh, celebrating uh, the birthday of Judy Garland. And of course, uh, one of the greatest movies ever made, A Star is Born. Uh, and of course, uh, after the film opened, they wanted to get more showings. And so uh, Warner Brothers Studios went in and cut the film to smithereens, which I personally believe, uh, and who knows, uh, but I personally believe it cost Judy Garland the Oscar. Uh, what are, what's your take on uh, that film, and uh, have you followed the history of that film because it was restored in 1983? I went to the restoration at Radio City Music Hall. Um, but that, to me, is 
in my opinion, a huge blemish on uh, the studio system as well. It was, and that was, a, that was a change in time in the studio system where more independent producers were coming with packaged projects, which Judy came, Judy Donna came with her husband, Sid Luff, to present that project uh, to Warner Brothers. So they were almost an independent production on the lot making that movie. Um, my father told me, who was at the time Jack Warner's assistant, one of his executive assistants, uh, said that, that they would always tie movies, the script. The script came in and they were going to make it. They said, how long is this movie going to be? And they had a man on the lot who I think worked in the story department or an editorial. And he would read the script and he'd, he'd tell him who the director was. And he'd come out with the running time pretty close to what the final running time of that movie was. And they said, oh, this is a three hour movie. I mean, so, so from the beginning, they knew it was going to be a very long movie, especially with George Cukor directing, mm -hmm. who directed all those beautiful backstage moments of stars and dancers and people going up and down and, you know, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I, I don't know what the contractual arrangement was with uh, Judy and her husband to how long the film could be, whether they had final cut, whether the studio had final cut or that they would release it initially in its long version. But I, well, after I, the movie, and then you've got the born in the trunk, which is 18 minutes. And that was tacked on, on top of all of that. Right. Right. But I do know there's a man who was a vice president in charge of sort of distribution, uh, Ben Calmonson in New York, who I'm sure argued he was very much a businessman. It was all business, it was all numbers with Ben Calmonson, who would probably he I'm sure he argued for like we're not getting the theaters are complaining. We're not getting enough showings. We need to get more money out of this film. So let's cut it down. Uh, my grandfather uh, would watch movies. He watched every foot of processed film that came through the studio. I mean, he watched the dailies. He was very up on what was being shot. Uh, and he also spent a lot of time in editorial and definitely with the trailers. He was big on marketing his films, on rewatching the trailers, making suggestions. So I'm sure him sitting there, he would ask the question as he did with most movies, is this a one piss picture or two piss picture? You know how many times we'd have to get up to go to the bathroom? <laughs> What a that, great quote. That was a category. If it became a three piss picture, you're in trouble. So, uh, you know, I can see them fighting over what to do about this. Because traditionally, Warner Brothers movies have been very tight and fast. You know, those movies from the golden age, with, you know, 88 minutes or whatever they were, then boy, story, story happened right away. Right off the bat, you knew what was going on and move along to the next scene. And, and that was sort of. Uh, everybody had that idea at the studio. My grandfather certainly did. Like, cut out those scenes. You don't need that. Walk up to the walk up to the uh, car. Or walk up to the apartment. Just get into the apartment. So it could have been the same mindset that was. And I'm glad they restored it. I know they they couldn't find all the footage, but it, yeah, it's a beautiful film. Uh, one little last story about that. Again, this is from the studio side. As I told you, I grew up hearing these kinds of stories. My father told me he went to to a party one night at Judy Garland and Sid Love's home. And he said, this looks very familiar around here. It's like I've been here before. Have I been here before? I don't think I have been. <laughs> I know where you're going. You know where I'm going. Yes, this, I'm is, going. <laughs> this is the furniture from the Stars Barn. <laughs> Wait a second. And he, and he called up uh, the studio, I guess, prop department or furniture department. He said, what, why, do they have, why do they have all the furniture from this movie? They said, they don't. They ordered double production of uh, the couches and the chairs from us. They said, oh, well, I didn't know about that. So he got the studio to pay for his <laughs> furnishings. That was Sid Luff's idea, I'm sure, not Judy Garland. I'm sure it was. Well, Gregory, I could go on and talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but I want to respect your time. I want to let everyone know, once again, the film is Jack O'Warner, The Last Mogul. Uh, it is such a great documentary. If you love movies, uh, you are going to love this film. And it's on demand. Uh, I went on last night. And uh, I, with, I was it through Amazon Prime that I saw it last night? Probably I, so. Yeah, probably. But uh, And uh, 
uh, and at a reasonable price, I might add. So it's, uh, you know, so go and watch this film. Uh, Gregory, before I let you go, I'm going to give you the final word today. Um, it could be about anything that we talked about that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about, or if there's anything that I didn't ask or talk about that you wish that I had, uh, now's your chance to get that out there as well. Uh, I'm going to give my final word, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. And when you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, tonight, uh, once again, are the Tony Awards. Uh, as you're watching the Tony Awards tonight, I want to give a shout out uh, to the Writers Guild of America, because what they are fighting for right now is very, very, very important. Uh, Gregory, I'm sure you'll agree with me on that. Uh, the industry has changed so much, uh, and it's getting harder and harder and harder uh, to make a living in this business because of streaming services and everything else that's going on. So as you're watching the Tonys tonight, uh, please understand that it's happening because of a special uh you know, agreement made with the Writers Guild of America. Uh, you may see a few actors, although in the theater, it's a little easier, I guess, for them, uh, struggling without a script to work with tonight. Uh, they cannot have a script. They will not be reading, I don't even think, from teleprompters because there's no one to put anything on the teleprompters. So as you're watching this tonight, uh, please let's support our writers. The Directors Guild of America may be next in line. Let's hope not and the Screen Actors Guild, the way that we watch movies is constantly evolving. And uh, there are other films, I'm sure, Gregory, along this line. God only knows what we're going to be talking about in 25 years from now. Uh, but anyway, I end every show by te telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Pick up the phone and call someone that you haven't spoken to in a while. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message. Uh, but uh, a phone call and let that person know that they matter in your life. It's important. And if you're able to preserve uh, these memories, uh, whether it be on film and everybody has a camera now, uh, so there's no excuse not to do this anymore. Uh, it's a lot easier than it was when you started out doing this, Gregory. Uh, so uh, everyone, uh, it won't be the same, but get it on your phone. Uh, get these uh, memories uh, preserved. I have a dear friend, he says, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. And with that, I'm going to leave the screen. And Gregory, it's all yours. And thanks again for spending an hour with me today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching and for uh, possibly watching my film. I hope you do, because I do think it's important that we understand the past and enjoy the past and Young people may think that the past is dead. It's nothing like the present, but human beings haven't changed that much. Simply the hats we wear or the wardrobe we wear. So I would urge younger viewers to take an interest in the past, take an interest in stories their parents or grandparents tell them and to preserve what they can. Uh, young people have to leave their own, lead their own lives and make their own art and create a new film industry going forward. But whatever comes out of this time, uh, someone will have to pay for it. So the era of just getting everything for free online does have to come to an end because uh, people do need to make a living. So I appreciate your time today and Richard for making this uh, platform available to my film and to me. And I do appreciate it and uh, my best regards. And uh, someone used to say, see you at the movies. I think that's appropriate.